Hi ladies, so today we're going to wrap up chapter 4. Um, we're talking about section 4. Section 4 covers the Catholicity of the Church's mission. The main idea is that the Catholicity of the Church is intertwined with Jesus' sending out his disciples to preach the good news to all people and all cultures. Um, so what we're talking about this section is how the church can apply to any and every culture and how the value of diversity in the cultures can help the church in a sense. And so we're going to go more in depth into how the church and culture kind of work together. So for the intro, it talks about how the church does not exist for her own sake, rather to share the good news till the ends of the earth. So the whole idea of the church, church's existence is not um, to look a certain way or to have a certain number of people or to benefit itself, but rather the bigger the better the church, the bigger the better the ability we have to share the good news, to preach to people who haven't been exposed to the gospel and to do what God calls us to do, what the mission of the church is, which is to bring Christ to the world. And so the church doesn't exist just for the sake of existing or for the sake of, I don't know, itself. It exists for the sake of everybody in this world. Um, so in your books on page 162, there's this passage and it says, he summoned the twelve and gave them the power and authority over all demons to cure diseases. And then he sent them to proclaim the kingdom of God and heal the sick. Then he sent, then he, they set out and went from village to village, proclaiming the good news and curing diseases. So this is the mission of the church. This is why God instituted the church to do these things, to cure diseases and share the good news. He didn't intend for the church to be a support group where people go and focus on themselves. And so um, that's not to say that you can't go to the church if you need to be served or if you need, if you have needs that need to be met by God. Um, but it's not the only thing it's there for. It's there for us to equip ourselves to share the gospel with others. And so once we've been served and our needs have been met, then we are able to go out and do this mission of the church. Um, Jesus, Jesus gave the church his authority, power, and responsibility. So not only do we have the authority and power to cure diseases and um, cast out demons, but also the responsibility to do so. The church was born by the power of the Holy Spirit on Jesus' twin actions of calling and sending. The purpose of the mission of Christ and the Holy Spirit is to invite all people to know and love God. So we've talked about this before. The whole idea of the church is so people can come to know God through us. Uh, so the Acts of the Apostles, the first or the church's first missionary manual. Um, the church's mission began at Pentecost when you guys are all familiar with the story, but this is when the apostles were given the gifts to share the gospel. The Holy Spirit came upon the apostles and anointed them and filled them with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Um, so the gifts of the Holy Spirit, you guys know. And so with those things, the apostles had the courage to go, the courage and the ability to go out and preach the gospels to the end of the earth. Um, it began a series of events that tell how the Holy Spirit is able to go beyond human, religious, and cultural differences to expand the boundaries of the church's communion. So as humans, we're kind of limited. Um, like if you were to want to go to another country and preach the gospel, you would need to know their language. You would need to understand their culture. You would need to know what religions existed and what they believed in order to respond to that disposition. Um, there are four examples in the book of Acts that talk about how the church shared the gospel with all people. I'm not spending too much time on those. Um, they're on page 163 and 164. And it talks about four different instances where cultural or religious or human differences made it so people wouldn't be inclined to interact with one another, um, especially take instruction from one another. So these apostles went out and 
reach these people that would not normally be receptive to them. And the only way that could have happened is with the Holy Spirit, because without the Holy Spirit, it, it just could not have happened, culturally speaking. So the first example, it talks about preaching to the Samaritans. So the Samaritans were mixed population of Israelites and Assyrians who accepted the law of Moses and belief in one God, but they did not accept the writings of the prophets or wisdom. So they rejected um, the temple in Jerusalem and constructed their own um, shrine. And so there was distrust between the Jews and the Samaritans, um, but the Holy Spirit was able to reach them anyways when the apostles um when the apostles went and spent the time to preach to them and pray with them, the apostles laid hands on them and received the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So the Samaritans and the Jews did not interact with each other. That was very uncommon. The story of the Good Samaritan affirms that. And so this is kind of cool because they were able to go past that, get past this, and share the good news with them. And the next one was Philip and the Ethiopian. He was able to apply. So Philip was kind of walking along this road and came across an Inu who was a person who followed some elements of Judaism but wasn't circumcised and usually didn't obey the Jewish dietary laws. But he was reading, when Philip was passing him, he was reading the book of Isaiah. And so Philip was able to apply this specific passage and say this is how it's relevant to Jesus Christ and so they talked and Philip was inspired and ended up getting baptized right then and there. So the next two are not, um, I don't want to spend too much time because we have a little bit left of this, but the conversion of St. Peter. Um, so after St. Paul had his big conversion, St. Peter had this vision and it's a kind of a cool passage to read, but the sh long short of it is that there was all of these different types of meat that the Jewish people could not consume prior to Jesus. And in this vision, Peter saw all these things, and Jesus said to Peter, it's not what goes into a person that defiles a man, but it's what comes out of him. And Peter didn't know like what any of this meant until he ended up having dinner with Cornelius. And then all of it came together and he understood that the dietary restrictions of the Jewish people no longer applied. And then the last one, um, there was kind of a lot of confusion whether or not Gentiles could find a place in the church, whether or not they had to be circumcised. And so the Council of Jerusalem discussed all of those things. And eventually officially recognized that they could indeed. So Catholicity and culture. As part of her ongoing missionary efforts, the church embraces the variety of cultures. The church embraces different styles, language, music, um, and styles of music and practice. Um, there's something I wanted to read. It must not be yet. Jesus himself was a part of a specific culture, which was intentional. So the book, actually, this is what I kind of want you guys to look at on page 165, not right now, but after, um, before you do your activity. I, there is, it talks about the different parts of Jesus's culture and why it was intentional and why he picked that time and place to become incarnate, to join us in society um, and to become a human. And so it's just kind of neat to look at and understand why he would pick then like he could have picked today and probably would have had better food better clothes all these things but he picked that time and place for a very specific uh, reason so the church can only complete her mission to share the good news with the world by sharing through the culture so without these different cultural practices it is harder to share the gospel without being familiar with the culture or the people you're sharing the good news with you just you just can't do it. Um, so, JP2, who is St. John Paul II now, said, A faith which does not become culture is a faith which has not been fully received, not thoroughly thought through, 
not faithfully lived out. I just like that quote from your books. The missionary work of sharing the gospel was, will always involve a tension with the culture that is both fitting in with the culture while not compromising the gospel message. So this is a constant struggle that the church faces, and it's important to find a balance. And so your book talks about that. It mentions um, history has been how it gives these really long examples that I'm just not a big fan of. But basically what they summarize is that it says that it's been sensitive to cultural differences and made efforts to maintain the universality of the church's teachings at the same time. And so some priests and bishops kind of have a hard time adapting the gospel message to a specific culture without compromising its integrity. And so, but it's, it's been a constant struggle since the beginning of history. Um, history also reveals that people are on one end or the other. So this isn't always true. Obviously, there's plenty of people who stick to where they should be. Um, but oftentimes people end up trying so hard to embrace culture that they lose the integrity of the faith. Or they try so hard to maintain the integrity of the faith that they forget about the importance of culture. And so it's not, it's, it's a very hard thing to balance. And everybody tries that in their own way. And some people succeed and some people do not. Um, so when abuses would occur, the Pope and the Church's Magisterium would respond in correction. Um, we have a few more minutes. So on page 168, it gives a good... Um, response to a problem. Let me just find it. And it just says, and it doesn't even really matter where exactly it said because it's pretty applicable to the whole church. But do not attempt in any way and do not in any pretext persuade these people to change their rights, habits, and customs unless they are openly opposed to religion and good morals. For what could be more absurd than to bring France, Spain, Italy, or any other European country to China. It is not your country, but the faith you must bring, or sorry, the faith you must bring, the faith which does not belittle the rights or customs of any nations, as long as these rights are not evil, but rather desires that they be preserved in the integrity and fostered. So the church teaches to embrace and utilize cultural differences without obstructing the integrity of the church and its truth. Um, but that can be hard, and so you need discernment, and, and you need to know what truth is. And so Vatican II also addressed this. Um, yeah, Vatican II was the most recent ecumenical council, and it also addressed this balance. So it's been a constant struggle since the beginning of our church to maintain this balance. Um, the beauty of this mark is that the church is for everyone, and so we know that because of the church's effort to embrace culture and to utilize it in our faith and help it, or let it help us grow closer to God. Um, so lastly, discernment and commitment to truth are important things in maintaining this balance. So I hope these through your comprehension questions. I hope you guys have a great day.